Now, the point here is not to make the case for modern-day Keynesian economics, nor to criticise Menzies for his lack of economic reform. This is not revisionism. Rather, it is to recognise Menzies as a political leader who responded to the challenges of post-war Australia. But it does pose this question for us all. How can Menzies, the man who invested so much in big Australia, with big government investment in energy, in science and in education, be the man who created a Liberal Party? What kind of liberalism is this? And that brings me to my second observation in reading this collection of essays. Menzies, refreshingly, was not an ideological man. A man of conviction, yes. A man of deeply held values, yes. He believed in the individual, the family, ordered liberty, the rule of law, reward for effort in the crown, in our institutions. But he was no dogmatist. He was pragmatic and much like Lincoln and Churchill, was prepared to adapt his means to suit his ends. I think Stephen Shavira and Greg Meliush's work in The Forgotten Menzies uh, is helpful here. As they note, Menzies has been described as a conservative, a liberal and a civic republican. But all those terms are modern day projections back onto a historical figure who likely would have quizzed such labels. Menzies was not doctrinaire and his writings on liberalism as Shavura and Meliush note were largely discursive and superficial. He did not advocate for an ideological liberalism, but instead built a movement that gave expression to the political principles uh, to many Australians who shared his views on the individual, the family and aspiration. And I think this is the towering strength of Menzies. Menzies had a big heart for a big country and he sought to build the biggest possible tent for aspirational Australians. His was a generous liberalism. And in this, I think Menzies was a master of political narrative rather than a proponent of political philosophy. Much like US President Franklin Roosevelt, famous for his radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats, Menzies understood how to capture the attention of regular Australians through the media of the time, in their language and through images that resonated. The Forgotten People Address is a case in point. Who can forget this line? And I quote, I do not believe that the real life of this nation is to be found either in great luxury hotels and the petty gossip of so-called fashionable suburbs or in the officialdom of the organised masses. It is to be found in the homes of people who are nameless and unadvertised and who, whatever their individual religious conviction or dogma, see in their children their greatest contribution to the immortality of their race. Like Australians back then, we can picture the great luxury hotels, grand yet cold, and we can feel the warmth of the homes inhabited by those nameless Australians he so loved. Anne Henderson, in her gripping chapter, Menzies and the Banks, concludes by quoting Menzies himself from Afternoon Light, where he wrote of Chifley's defeat in 1949, and this is Menzies here, if one's ideas are so rigid that they will not bend, the chances are that they will break. Put another way, in politics, you can pursue ideological purity and suffer defeats, or you can be guided by your principles and win victories. Perhaps that is the secret to Menzies' seven straight election victories, principled wins rather than pure losses.